Jasmine Orsak, and this is WBAL Channel 9 News. Here in the studio, we have just been informed of a breaking news story taking place right outside of Edgewood High School. A local high school student realized the impact of discrimination in her classroom. I repeat, this is a real live breaking news story. Turning it over to Ashley Yelra to uncover the details. Thank you, Jasmine. I'm here with Lydia Yellow, who claims to have just experienced an act of perceptual bias. Lydia, would you like to elaborate on this experience? Well, I was sitting in class waiting for the bell to ring when my teacher began to tell a story. The story itself is moderately harmless, but the reaction to it is what really caught me off guard. After hearing about the difficulty of pronouncing black names, one of my classmates said, if only black people knew how to spell. Could you repeat that for the viewers, please? Yeah, one of my classmates said, if only black people knew how to spell. And how did you feel about that? It mostly got me thinking, what made him say that? Was it from pure ignorance, or did he say it because of the things around him? Which raises a larger question. To what extent are perceptual biases determined by cultural experiences? To what extent, indeed, are perceptual biases determined by cultural experiences? You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Back to you, Jasmine. Well, Lydia's question got us thinking as well. In order to fully understand the question at hand here, we called in our expert analysis, Riley Real, to unpack the question and explain what's really going on. Riley? Hi, Jasmine. Before we can really unpack this question, let's read through it once more. To what extent are perceptual biases determined by cultural experience? As you can see, there are several terms we need to define here in order to really understand what Lydia is asking, such as perceptual biases and cultural experience. These are really the key components to understanding this particular question. In the context of the real life situation Lydia gave us, I'll say that perceptual bias refers to the bias that occurs due to our perception of reality, more commonly known as discrimination. In the situation that Lydia presents us with, this is concerning discrimination based on race, otherwise known as racism. As for cultural experience, this refers to the surrounding a person is born into, their culture, and how those experiences shape them. In simpler terms, to what extent is discrimination caused by the society one is born to, rather than a different cause, such as genetics. Back to you, Jasmine. Thank you, Riley. That was Riley Real for our viewers who are just tuning in, our expert question on Patrick. We have brought in a few more experts to help us determine a solution to the question Lydia Yellick has extracted from her real life situation. I'm here with Jonathan Meyer and Sylvia Stout to talk more about the situation at hand here. Just a quickly recap, we recently spoke to a young woman at Edgewood High School who gave us an insight to her classroom, in which a young man said, if only black people would learn how to spell. This sparked the question in Lydia, to what extent are perceptual biases determined by cultural experience? Sylvia, what do you have to say about this situation? Well, for me, it raises many more questions that also need to be answered, such as, how do emotions play a role in understanding perceptual bias? Or, why do people get so upset about discrimination? Does this apply to non-Western cultures? And to what extent is it morally accepted to assert dominance over someone else's way of living? And I totally agree. In order to really understand what's happening here, we need to break it down and look at it from multiple angles. The question we should really be focusing on right now is whether or not this behavior is a natural occurrence or if it's, some, it's caused more by the surrounding environments. Looking at this from an environmental standpoint, we can say a variety of circumstances that exemplify our reasoning for this behavior. Would you give us an example of this behavior? Of course. Um, the strongest examples are those the most closely related with culture, that is, the arts and even some indigenous areas. Um, some of the strongest cases we have toward this issue is the whitewashing of media and literature. Whitewashing? Could you explain for the viewers what exactly that is? Uh, whitewashing is a common practice which involves removing people of color from lead roles or excluding people of color issues such as slavery or racism in order to appeal to a wider audience. Examples of the Examples of this can be seen in literature such as the young adult book Liar by Justine Larbalestier. In the first printing of the book, a white woman was placed on the cover, despite the fact that in the novel the protagonist, is, protagonist was described as being half white and half black, indicating that her skin would be of a darker skin tone, and later was described as wearing her hair naturally. However, in the initial printing of the book, the character on the cover did not reflect this description. I've just received news that we have a before and after image of the book, and we will show it to you now. As you can clearly see, the cover on the right is the intended, intended depiction of the main character, Mika. It was published after public outcry. I forgot to mention earlier, but Justine Larbalestier is an Australian author. This is important as it shows that this isn't just the United States that is experiencing this whitewashing phenomena. That is an interesting point. It is, and I think it illustrates the widespread nature of discrimination. 
It does, yes, but hitting a little closer to home are the textbooks that we teach to our own children. A recent article written by Bob Peterson titled The Whitewashing of the Past, a proposal for a national campaign to rethink textbooks, Peterson explains that even though publishers make claims about being multicultural and honoring our nation's diversity, none of the fifth grade of United States history textbooks, even those exceeding 800 pages, examines the role of racism in the U.S. history, or even mentions the word racism. In two textbooks, the word discrimination doesn't even appear. Wow, that is truly astonishing. It really is. It brings home the false idea that by ignoring race and problems associated with it, they will simply go away, which simply isn't the case. But I'll talk more about that a little bit later. In order to really reiterate the reality of our nation's textbook crisis, I thought it would be beneficial to interview some local high school students from the same high school in which the story originally broke. We now go live to our reporter on the field, Ashley. Ashley? Hello, Jasmine. I'm here live with two students who also attend Edgar High School. Could you please say your names and grades for us, please? Hi, I'm Lindsay, and I'm a senior. Uh, Olivia, also a senior. And what can the two of you tell me about the whitewashing of history textbooks? Are you both familiar with the term whitewashing? And um, what can you tell about your first experience with whitewashing? Well, it's my senior year in high school, and up until a few weeks ago, I didn't know about the decimation of the Native American population. Um, my AP U.S. history teacher explained to me that the government used to encourage Americans to hunt buffalo for sport because it was a main resource for the Native Americans. Uh, he also told me that every treaty that we've ever held with the Native Americans has been broken by the United States. Did he tell you this verbally or was it in the textbook? Uh, he told us verbally. I checked the textbook too and it mentioned some stuff about the things the U.S. did to the Native Americans, but it didn't really seem as bad in the textbooks. And you, Lindsay? Well, right now I'm taking an African American history class and it makes me realize that important events for minorities are skips. Uh, can you elaborate on some of the events you're talking about? Well, slavery for one, and also Japanese internment camps and Latino immigration. They're depicted as being really insignificant to the formation of America, but really they would shape America thus far. Thank you, Lindsay, Olivia, Jocelyn, back to you. Another article published by Robert Morris states that, for instance, some history texts will discuss how European immigrants came to the United States seeking a better life and expanded opportunities, but will note that slaves were brought to America. Not only does this omit the destruction of African societies and families, but it ignores the role of northern merchants and southern slaveholders in the profitable trade of human beings. Other books will state that the Continental Railroad was built, conveniently omitting information about the Chinese laborers who built much of it or the oppression that they suffered. Sylvia, what do you think ultimately is the effect of removing events concerning people of color, and what does it have to do with the original situation? I believe that by removing important events such as slavery or the civil rights movement or the treatment of the Japanese people during World War II, ultimately leaves the general population clueless of reality. School is where young people are getting a majority of their knowledge, and leaving out such important facts such as the one Ava mentioned causes ignorance at a very early age. I see. Mr. Meyer, do you have anything else to add? Not really. Sylvia pretty much covered it all. <laughs> but I think it's important to note that whitewashing of the media is also an extremely negative influence on both cultural experience and, consequently, perceptual bias. Please elaborate. Well, by casting positive characters as white and more negative characters as people of color, it's perpetuating a stereotype that people of color are of lesser worth than whites, and thus, in this case, less intelligent and incapable of spelling. A very good example of this is the recent movie Exodus, Gods and Kings. Oh, what is it about this movie that makes it such a prime example of replacing strong people of color with white people? As a movie that is to tell the story of Moses, it takes place in the African country of Egypt. Because of its location, one would assume that a majority of the color characters would be people of color, when in fact, the cast list looks a lot like this. Oh, wow. You can see that those in power are casted as white people, and those who are criminals or servants are cast as African Americans, despite the fact that the film takes place in Egypt. Once again, this is perpetuating the idea that blacks and other minorities are incapable of holding higher positions, such as kings or advisors, and are thus handed the role of criminal by society. You'll find that when blacks are given roles aside from the ones above, there's often outcry against it. For example, the movie The Hunger Games was a huge hit in the United States, earning $155 million on its opening weekend. This, however, was overshadowed by the faction of fans who were severely disappointed by the casting of characters Thresh, Sinna, and Rue. As you can see, all three of these actors are black. In the novel, Rue was described as having dark brown skin and eyes, while Thresh was written to have the same dark skin as Rue. Accurately portrayed by Amanda Steinberg and Dio Okanee, as for Cinna, he was merely described as having short hair and was chosen to be played by Lenny Kravitz by the casting team. These were the responses from popular social media site Twitter after the release of the film. 
As you can see, breaking out from the whitewashed mold causes a larger turbulent outcry than simply sticking with the status quo. This has happened historically, especially in the case of Native Americans in the classic American Western style movie. Uh, we would like to show you a clip to illustrate the point that Sylvia is making. Yes, they fought savagely, for they were a primitive people, and self-preservation is a primitive instinct. They say history is written by the winners, and that's surely the case when it comes to the way Native Americans have been portrayed in the movies. Now, we all know that every movie needs a villain, but during the last hundred years, more than 4,000 movies have cast Indians in that role, depicting them as bloodthirsty savages. Scenes of peaceful wagon trains being attacked by marauding Indians were common plot devices in Westerns. I grew up at a time when John Ford and John Wayne and Randolph Scott et al. were uh, massacring Indians with single shots. Turn around, dirt. Right on! Yeah, that was in the late 40s, and I was in elementary school in Vallejo, California. Because of those movies, my brother and I were the only Indians in in the neighborhood and in town and in school. We had to fight our way out of those theaters. Well, as children, that's who we saw. So we never saw our own image in its reality. And so we had to create our own image from the time we were growing up. To be strong and proud of who we were was a joke. You couldn't do it. Engine run their dot gum dot blasted sheep over our land just like they owned it. Why don't they stay on the reservation where they belong? My son asked me this one time. He goes, where are the Indians, Mom? Why don't they have them in, in this movie? And I was like, well, maybe that's when they put us on the res. Motion pictures in the United States have been made for white audiences to make money and to portray history. I don't think it's fair to say just to make money, but it is fair to say that the white audience has uh, predominated. The white men of the West cannot and will not recognize the testimony of those Indians who slaughtered, massacred, and ambushed our parents. The tribes of the North meet at River Rock to once and forever wipe out all white. Well, I think that the bottom line is they weren't looking for an accurate portrayal. They weren't trying to tell a Native American story. They were trying to tell a uh, Euro-American story. Man doesn't forget easily when his wife and kids were butchered. Cheyenne, wasn't it? Cheyenne, Apache, Blackfoot Sioux. They're vicious killers, all of them. They ain't even human. Not only was the portrayal of the Native American unrealistically negative, but the portrayal of the white man was often unrealistically positive. Ultimately, you have some contest between the white guy, who is the exemplar of the rugged frontiersman on the one hand, and Indians on the other, and the white guy beats them every time. He's better at being an Indian than they are. There's nothing a white man's not better at being than an Indian. Horrifying pages in the bloody annals of Indian warfare. A vivid recreation, a day when a lost patrol found the garrison of Fort Bowie slaughtered to the last man. Tomahawk Trail is a classic Western formula. It talks about Indian ferocity. It talks about Apache atrocities. It shows essentially the American army and American settlers outnumbered and threatened by an overwhelming force of Native Americans. Never have so few so bitterly offended the victims of Apache savagery. It was just the opposite. Historically, we're talking about the Native Americans were overwhelmed by white population and settlement. But for the sake of the motion picture, and unfortunately, to perpetuate the image of the savage Native American, history is turned around and modified to suit the formula. What happened? They've had their hair cut by you and Bob. How can you speak so unfeelingly? I'm feeling, Miss Monroe. I knew these folks and blazed the trail that brought them here. This is how my parents died, fire and scalping. Thanks to Hollywood, this country refuses to face 
what happened to Indian people. It takes a blue coat to make a white man a soldier. But a Cheyenne is a soldier from the first slap on his bottom. War is his life. He's fierce, he's smart. And he's meaner than sin. And scalps to the Indians, Major, like your medals, and gotten by the same means, killing. <laughs> By ignoring the Indian and what we have to say, you are dooming your own country. Because there is a saying, a nation that does not know its history has no future. As one scholar to another, Ms. Dow, I'd like to ask you your opinion on the impact of language on discrimination. Of course. Um, language is arguably one of the largest areas of knowing. It is the medium in which we learn, we teach, we portray our ideas largely through language. And thus, language has an undeniable power over us as a culture. The way that you say things will shape someone's opinion about it indefinitely. Of course. So, in the case of discrimination and shaping biases towards people, language plays a rather large role. I touched on it earlier, but often the tragedies that early non-white culture experience, like slavery or the decimation of Native American culture, are drastically understated. Texas will say things like, the Indians were shrewd and stubborn negotiators when dealing with the accretions of land, rather than say that the Native Americans were rightfully protecting the very little land they had left. This was taken from the American pageant, a book from a book for AP US history, so even higher level courses aren't acknowledging the horrendous acts committed against Salmon culture in the nation's earliest days. Rather, it simplifies and thus takes away from the takes away from the importance. Um, one of my favorite articles titled Racism in the English Language, written by Robert Moore, states that the symbolism of white as positive and black as negative is pervasive in our culture. Good guys wear white hats and ride white horses. Bad guys wear black hats and ride black horses. Angels are white, devils are black. The definition of black includes without any moral light or goodness, evil, wicked, indicating disgrace and sinful, while that of white includes morally pure, spotless, innocent, and free from evil intent. From this I can confidently say that the foundation of the English language aid the discrimination against non-white people. It feeds a false sense of superiority unconsciously into white people and has the opposite effect on non-white people. Considering that this is the same language we are teaching the young children, we need to consider the fact that it's the very language we speak that begins a vicious cycle of white privilege. However, in direct relation to Lydia's situation, I would like to say this. AABE, or African American and Vernacular English, is not introduced as an official dialect of English in textbooks or in the classroom, and many are ignorant to its existence. This may explain why the young man speaking around Lydia may have accused black people of not knowing how to speak. He simply didn't know any better. Rather than knowing and understanding that black people often speak in a dialect different than his own, he simply assumed that they are uneducated. Do you have any concluding statements that you would like to make? Art and language are the catalyst to long fame discrimination. To fix the problem of perceptual bias, we first have to fix two of the most widely used areas of knowledge by the public. As perpetuating black stereotypes not only causes non-black people to believe these stereotypes, it causes blacks to fulfill their own stereotypes. Well, thank you, Sylvia, for that explanation for our question. It was my pleasure. Um, now, we've received a tweet from our live Twitter feed that reads, Loving the segment thus far. One question, what about everyone else? I doubt racism just happens between blacks and whites. Um, Sylvia, Jonathan, do either of you have anything in response? I think one of the most widely ignored oppressed cultures is that of the Native Americans. There is very little research on Native American culture, which leads to the problem in its own. How can we determine the damage being done on the Native population if we don't conduct studies concerning them? We touched on it earlier, but the damage inflicted on Native Americans is absolutely horrendous. According to an article by PBS, Academics estimate that approximately 20 million people may have died in the years following the European invasion, up to 95% of the population of the Americas. Not to mention the seizing of land, the gross misrepresentation by the media, and offensive mascots that are still in place today. As you can see, the lands that Native Americans once held have shrank in the Also, adding on to this point, Olivia said earlier she was majorly unaware of these atrocities. As I've been saying repeatedly, ignorance is the real cause of racial discrimination in this country. Our people need to be educated. Sadly, due to time constraints, we need to move on to a slightly more scientific viewpoint. Um, how would you approach this question, Mr. Myers? Just to make sure we're still clear on the question, could you repeat it for me? Sure, of course. The question is, for those of you who are just tuning in, to what extent are perceptual biases determined by cultural experience? Right, right. Well, my initial thoughts upon hearing the question is, if perceptual biases isn't determined by cultural experience, what is it determined by? 
This led me to do research in the human sciences regarding some more genetically based cause for discrimination based on race. And what did you find in your research? There is clear evidence that supports the idea that, at the very least, prejudice is something that occurs without much effort on the person's end. For example, according to the article, What is the Psychology Behind People's Prejudice, written by Kendra Cherry, the human mind must think with the aid of categories, Alcord explained. Once formed, categories are the basis for normal pre prejudgment. We cannot possibly avoid this process. Orderly living depends upon it. And what does this mean for you to think living? Mostly it means that, without meaning to, people place other people into categories that are either themselves or different from themselves. This is a natural process and often results in what psychologists call us versus them. Created by Henry Tajfeld, the founder of social psychology, us versus them is the idea that in order to increase self-esteem and self-image, we naturally enhance the status of the group we belong to. This is apparent in senses of nationalism or in extreme cases such as discrimination, superiority of race. Now, is there any research that explains why humans naturally do this? Well, while not very useful today, this was a main method of survival in early history. In order to keep a pack or tribe safe, one had to be able to quickly establish whether or not a person was a part of their group and able to be trusted, or if that person was a part of a deferring group and therefore dangerous. This quotation from the article, The Evolution of Prejudice, sums it up pretty well. Group living also made, up, made us more wary of outsiders who could potentially harm the group by spreading diseases, killing, or hunting individuals, or stealing precious resources. To protect ourselves, we develop ways of identifying who belongs to our group and who doesn't. Over time, this process quickly evaluating others might have become so streamlined that it became unconscious. Now, taking all of this into account, how does this event support or disprove the idea that cultural experience is the cause of perceptual bias? Plainly, it means that rather than being taught to discriminate by a person's surrounding, people may innately incline to be biased towards specific groups because of the obvious difference, such as skin color. I see. Sylvia, do you have anything uh, to say on the matter? Um, just that I recently read an article, excuse me, I recently read an experiment in which they took 26, uh, 12 male and 14 female students from an introductory psychology courses at the University of Washington and asked them to look at a series of names that were voted to be held by either white people or black people. While looking at these names, they were asked to identify which names they associated with being more pleasant. What were the results? The results reveal patterns consistent with the expectation that white subjects would display an implicit attitude difference between black and white racial categories. More specifically, the data indicated an implicit attitude and a preference for white over black manifests as, fast, manifests as faster responding for the white plus pleasant combination than for the black plus pleasant combination. And who was that study conducted by? Uh, Anthony Greenwald and Dave McGee. Uh, I'd like to return a question of my own to Mr. Myers, if that's all right. Uh, you claim that to a certain extent prejudice is a natural occurrence, correct? Correct. So, in reference to a previous question, if this is the way that people naturally live, what right do others have morally to try and change this way of living? Well, going off of Kantian ethics, specifically deontology, we follow three main pillars or maxims of the idea. The first being universality. While racial discrimination does occur through various races and across mul multiple cultures, I doubt there is anyone who can rally for racism against all races, as nothing would ever be accomplished. Kant's second maxim states that human beings must be treated as an end rather than a means to an end. Basically, you aren't allowed to manipulate a person to get a more beneficial result. Applying this directly to the situation at hand here, no one is allowed to be racist as harming another person physically or mentally is morally unacceptable to do. And the very last of these maxims is that one should always behave as if they are moral kings or queens of the universe. This is especially crucial in the argument. If every single person took it upon themselves to move past prejudice, discrimination, or other harmful actions, the world would be a place of equality. Uh, while I certainly believe in what Mr. Myers is saying, I'd like to point out that Kantian ethics is, a rather, is rather absolute with no room for moral gray area. For example, it's morally unjustifiable to lie in Kantian ethics, and thus following this creates a conflicting thought pattern. If prejudice is innate, one would be wrong to lie about it, but they would also be wrong to tell to verbally tell someone of a different skin color or gender that they felt this prejudice. I believe the opposite to be true. I think that in order to put prejudice behind us completely, we need to acknowledge its existence and move on, rather than pretending it doesn't exist. One last question for the both of you then. 
Um, why do you think racism is such an emotional experience, and do emotions hinder the consequences? Well, the real problem arises when these innate prejudices turn into a more offensive stance on race. Lydia was probably so distraught by the words of her classmate as they, whether it was purposely done or not, implied the inferiority of not only her culture, but of her social identity. Following a similar train of thought, innate prejudice can lead to a much more violent kind of discrimination. Take, for example, the death of Mr. Eric Gardner or other attacks against innocent black males. Can you clarify what innocent consists of? Innocent in the sense that no crime has been committed. Despite video records of his calm resistance towards an unjust arrest, he was killed largely because of the predetermined stereotype that black people are dangerous. Uh, this mindset that black people are deadly stems not only from prior experience, but from the installment of racism from a very early age through language, media, neural categories, etc. Thank you, Jonathan Sylvia. Now that we've heard from two very different explanations to the question at hand here, it's time to draw a conclusion in reference to the difficult situation at hand. On one hand, there is the innate prejudice that people hold for others based on visible differences. And on the other hand, there is the omittance of important events for people of color. Based on the evidence that has been given, it can be concluded that while people do have innate prejudices for others, these prejudices are supported, strengthened, and perpetuated by the lack of knowledge given about non-white oppression and the negative lighting that the media commonly shines on people of color.